If the train doesn't get out now, it'll never reach its destination. So, uh, right? You know, I have an arrangement with the airlines that uh, if I get there late, they leave anyway. So, uh, you know. <laughs> That's kind of a covenant where they manufacture that. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> yes. Well, I, you can't believe I used to fly every week a year ago last March. I haven't flown for over a year. And to be very frank with you, I don't miss it. <laughs> so, good morning, everyone. I just uh, for the few that are here this morning, I just want to remind you that, and if you got. Uh, the email from Pastor Lonsbury that we will be breaking into a class study beginning May 1st over there and so forth. So there will be a sanctuary Sabbath school and there will also be, if you like, a kind of a group type Sabbath study. We'll be doing that over there on May 1st. So anyway. So we're going to get back there so we can talk with each other. With yeah, that's right. That way we get to know each other, which may be good, may be bad. I don't know. We'll have to see. But... Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I guess if we were going to look at the lesson this morning, we could title it this way, The Times of Noah and the Two Covenants. And so we'll try to cover all of that. Uh, there's a lot of material this morning, and so we'll try to get into that if we can. And so we're going to start with uh, Genesis 6, 5, and 11, and uh, you can turn to your Bibles, or you can just take it off of this. And uh, I want to thank the uh, department over here to my left, who's actually, we weren't going to have any slides at all, but uh, miracles do happen. So, all right, let's take uh, Genesis chapter 6, 5 through 11. Before we start, why don't we bow our heads for a word of prayer, okay? Father, as we come to you this morning, we give thanks for Jesus and his love and his goodness. And uh, boy, do we need to see goodness in our world today. We are thankful that we can come to the throne of grace and experience it personally. We pray for your presence with us and the Holy Spirit to guide us through this lesson. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, let's take a look at this text. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. You know, are we talking about today? <laughs> I read that text. I thought, wait a minute. And, uh, you know, I was just thinking for a moment of all the things that have gone on in this world over the last, it's evolved over time, but where we're at today. And I uh, got up, was it yesterday morning, you can help me with that, and I opened it up, and what do you think I read? Headline, another shooting, and this is at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis, eight people killed and five injured. It's getting to the point where it's almost a norm, isn't that right? And it isn't just that, when we think about the evil in the world, we think about how impolite and how lack of senses, uh, the sensitivity that we have toward other people. Constantly condemning, constantly pointing out their weaknesses rather than their strengths. We see that all the time. We see that from the very top of those who should be good leaders for us. Isn't that right? And uh, so, you know, it's just one thing after another. And I think about those eight people and it sometimes makes you angry, but I got to thinking, what about the families of those eight people? What about the spouse? What about the children? What about their friends? What about their church associates? How many people are really affected? A multitude. And I think, you know, as God looks down, it said he was sorrowed that he had made the human race because he was so filled with hurt and pain. Can you imagine? And he's been experiencing this from the time of the fall and so forth. Why don't you take your mask off? <coughs> How's that? Be fine. Whoa! Do I feel better? <laughs> now, I won't breathe on you, I promise. So uh, if I can't hear you, I'll, when I get close, I'll pull my mask up. Is that okay with you? And so forth. All right. So uh, anyway, we can blame Bob as a scapegoat uh, since yeah, I don't have it up here. So. Breathe on me, I'll take it. All right, well, let's continue on here. It says that every inclination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil. Every inclination, every thought was constantly evil, okay? Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of... Doesn't that tell you where we're at today? 
Would you say our world today is full of violence? Would we be exaggerating that? Would we be manipulating God's word by saying we live in a very violent world today? Would you say that's true? Maybe another term is that we live in a very lawless world today. That true? Uh, and so forth. So things are bad. And um, I don't mean to say that because sometimes as Seventh-day Adventists and others, we talk about the urgency of the second coming. You know, Jesus didn't talk about its urgency. Did you know that as you go through the scriptures? He talked about famines and earthquakes. What did he say about that, though? He said, but the time is not yet. Don't misread those. The time is not yet. And so forth. And sometimes I felt that people use that to push a guilt complex on people to work on urgency. If you talk about urgency enough, what happens? It's the guy who called wolf when the wolf never came. Isn't that right? And so forth. For you and I, if Jesus comes today or 100 years from now, the point is when we die, he's come. Isn't that true? Uh, and so forth. So the world's full of violence, and we can't understand it. You know, and what's going on here? What is the, what's, what's the reason for all of this? What's this all of, how do we get to this position? And so that's our first question this morning. How is it possible that the world could have fallen so short from God's ideal in such a short time? From the fall of Adam to after Methuselah to Lamech and all the way over to Noah it was not that long. People had lived a long time then and so forth. Can you imagine living 800 years and 900 years in that kind of a, an environment? Who would want to? So anyway, the question is, how is it possible? That's our question this morning, and we'll see what, what you think on that, then we'll take a look at some other uh, answers from that perspective. How is it possible we could have gotten that far? What could have happened? Patriarchs and prophets says that the world looked very much like Eden before the flood. Beautiful, gorgeous. Okay, plenty of food to eat. They had everything they could have wanted in nature and so forth. So, I'll help you out a little bit. And by the way, what was the primary cause of their wickedness? That's critical too in our lives because why is there so much evil in the world? And you know, is there, is there really a very simple answer for that? All right, let's go try it. Okay, we got three episodes here. What's the first one? Can you see it? We're looking at sin, and in this situation on the first part of that slide there, Adam and Eve. Okay, so what was Eve's sin? What caused her to sin? Adam's was not the same. Okay, she didn't trust God, and she was deceived because she looked at the fruit, and it looked like it was great for food, right? She used her senses to make a decision on right and wrong. Isn't that true? How easy is that for us? You know, I, uh, <clears throat> when I took a public speaking class, uh, you know, I never took one in college. Did they offer speech in college? Yeah. I guess. I never took it. I got economics instead. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, I took a speech class. And they were talking about great speakers. What is the attribute of a great speaker? Can you think of one? What would be a great attribute of a great speaker? Maybe you can think of a pastor. This guy can, you know, great pastor when it comes to public speaking. What makes a good public speaker, do you think? Good communicator. Good communicator. Okay. How about charisma? Charisma help? They have life. They can deliver, right? So it's possible to have a bad message and deliver very well. Would you agree? And that's what's happening with Eve. Satan was a great deliverer, but his content was poor, right? So what did she listen to? What, what attracted her? Not so much as content. Remember, Eve made a statement that wasn't true. And he said, did God say you should not eat of this tree? And she made a misstatement. She said, God said we should not even touch the tree. God didn't say that. He said, only if you eat of the tree, you shall die, didn't he? And so forth. Now, it's probably good that uh, they didn't get close enough to touch it because probably the next step would be to eat it. But the point is, I think it's easy for all of us. I'm certainly impressed with people who have great speak, but what is their content? It's curiosity. 
curiosity. You mean on the receiver yes. of that? Or? Well, first he saw the, the snake. Yeah. And it had wings. It was beautiful. Oh, it was gorgeous. Wow. Yeah. And then it talked. And it talked? Okay. And he was curious. Okay. And the fruit looked good? You know, what could God have yeah. a problem with this? Why would God take, keep that away from uh, Don't we do that? When yeah. we think of when we've fallen and slipped, haven't we used that same kind of reasoning and so forth? So she was deceived, okay? Uh, Adam's problem, real quick, because we've got to move on, is, was what? He was not deceived. He knew, so who did he put before God? For a while, anyway. This woman that you gave me, <laughs> that changed quick, did it not? So anyway, yeah, he knew, and yet he sided with his wife. But he knew she was wrong didn't say anything. You know, in fact, in, in fact, when he got the fruit, he didn't say anything, at least in Scripture. He said he took it and he ate, and so forth. All right, let's go down to the next one, Cain and Abel. How close are we to the falling of, uh, of, of Adam? Very close, right? We don't know how many years before she got pregnant. She had Cain, and then she had Abel. And so forth. We're not necessarily sure it was the first two children. Some commentators say we're not sure about that. Okay. Uh, so, anyway, um, there's reasons for that. We won't go into that. What was the issue with Cain and Abel? What was Cain's sin? All right, well, that's, that's really the reason for what happened, right? We're going to get into that because it says that God looked at Noah with favor. So I just want you to remember that when, when Cain brought his best that he could bring. So he was jealous? Well, let's think about that for a moment. That God accepted Cain and Abel and not him. Okay. Would you say that both boys or young men brought the best that they could bring from their own perspective, right? Okay. The problem is what was acceptable about Abel's gift as compared with offering as compared with Cain's? Okay. Cain said, this is what I've done and I'm bringing it to you for your favor, right? Abel is coming, and he knew what it meant to sacrifice. He's saying, I'm coming because I'm not good enough, and I need a blood sacrifice to cover my sin. God said he looked upon Abel with favor. Same thing he said about Adam, Adam I should say about Noah. So we're going to come back to that. Last one is Lamech. Lamech was uh, the son of Methuselah, who lived 969 years, and he was the father of Noah. Now, if you look at that picture, it's hard to see, but it looks like he had more than one wife. He did. And he did. So he violated the principle of polygamy. God said, you'll have one wife. And somebody in the crowd said, that's good enough. <laughs> Isn't that right? And he also did what Cain did. A young man injured him, the Bible says, and Lamech said he killed him. So we see this progression of sin, and it starts pretty quick after the fall, right? And then it brings us to the time of Noah. So, antediluvians, who were they? We're going to talk about that in a real quick. Antediluvians. People before the flood. Pardon? People that were before the flood. Before the flood. It was a time before the flood, and these people were giants, some of them were, and some of these people were men of renown. We have people, men and women of renown, and what they say we sometimes buy into, right? Uh, and so forth. They have influence on us. So let's take a look at this. This is some patriots and prophets. Now remember our initial question is how could sin progress so quickly? What was the cause of this sin? What was the real cause? So let's take patriots and prophets. Excellent statement. Let's take a look at it. God bestowed upon these antediluvians many and rich gifts, but they used his bounties to glorify themselves 
and turn them into a curse by fixing the thick affections upon the gifts rather than the creator. How hard is that to do or how easy is that to do? How subtle could that be? Have you ever had talked to a person who loved to be out in nature? Bob is one of those. I like it. Probably most of us do. But is it possible that nature can become our God and not God himself? Is that easy to do? Things that are really kind of good become a curse because they put, we put that over God, right? I don't know if you can think of some other things. Nature could be one, all right? But Romans tells us that nature can be a benefit because those who don't know, have never known God, have never read scripture, don't know anything, God says that they are without excuse because they have nature or what God has created as an example, right? So we have to have a kind of moderation on that. Well, let's go on. They sought only to gratify the desires of their hearts. We know all about that. They reveled in scenes of pleasure and wickedness, not desiring to retain God in their knowledge. Would you say that is the biggest problem of society today? They have no desire to know God. What do you think? Is that the cause of all sin? They had no desire to have a knowledge of God. What do you think? How did it happen? Not desiring the knowledge of God. How did it happen that they... Okay. Uh, would you say the world today has a desire to know God? It's all right. Uh, we're, oh, we are on national television, so I guess maybe I can understand your hesitation. Uh, but uh, yeah, in essence... For the most part. Pardon? For the most part. Most part. You don't hear that on the news. If anything, you hear that in schools, they don't want prayer. They don't want any of that stuff, right? Evolution is the main theme. God is out of the picture. There is no desire for knowledge of him. That was a problem in the days of Noah. And what did Jesus say about the days of Noah? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the second coming of Christ. Is that true? So what we're seeing today, when you say, how do I get prepared? Study the events of Noah and who Noah was. And that's why those covenants are so important. So they have a lack of knowledge. Now, let me ask you something, and it's a tough question, because it could be self-incriminating for all of us. How do we as Christians portray a lack of desire to know God? How could we be guilty of that? Think about it for a moment. We get too busy in our own. Pardon? We get too busy with our own lives. Okay, busy bodies. I mean, I, I, I confess. <laughs> uh, I confess, I've been there, you know, I'm slightly retired now. Richard, I'll explain that later. I am slightly retired now, and so forth. But the thing is, is I work long hours, uh, many times six days a week, long hours as a consultant, and so forth. Some of you are probably in that boat, one way or the other, or you're tied up with other things. We get so busy, we forget to what? Spend time with God. Have you ever ran off to go to work and you hadn't prayed? You walked out without his help and assistance and asking for him, right? Have you sometimes not been diligent in your study of the scriptures? That, in a sense, for us as Christians, is not designed to retain a knowledge of God, because that's where we get it, right? Prayer is the power of God, isn't that right? And sharing is a result, yes. A lot of the problem today is it's not that people are doing so much wrong, that they're not doing what is right and instructed. That's a good point, Bob, that's excellent, it's true. Yeah, they're not really evil people, they're just not following instruction. They don't feel the need of God. Okay. Yeah. The lack of sensitivity, murder, and all these other things. That's not the issue. It's a result of the issue, but it's not the issue. 
That's why when people say, well, we got to pass laws to change behavior. Laws don't change behavior except for fear, but it doesn't change the heart. Isn't that right? You may not do it because you don't want to go to jail. You may not do it for other reasons and so forth, but they're not sold on it. And so, in essence, the only way we're going to change society is to change their hearts. Isn't that right? That is the only way. But the world says, ah, we're not going to go that way. We're going to go the way of Cain. We're going to go the way of, I'm going to bring what I think is best, and I'm going to leave God out. Right? And here's what happens. For the wisdom of man is as foolishness to God. We can understand that. All right, well, let's go on. It says, because they didn't retain knowledge of God, they soon came to deny his existence. You ever heard of, heard of evolution? That's primarily today in science. Okay, it's in the classrooms. It's everywhere. Okay, it's denying God's existence. Yes. Therefore, he's denying God. That's right. Now, see, we could have an intellectual understanding of God, right? But when it comes to do we really believe him? And this is what's going to be part of our lesson today. How do we illustrate that we really trust God? That's what we call sanctification today, right? So we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. It says here also, they adorned nature in place of God. They glorified human genius. They worshiped the works of their own hands. And they taught their children to bow down to graven images. When we don't, let me ask you this. As parents, when we don't bring the gospel into our home, are we guilty of that? Because we're teaching them another way to live their life. Another way of something else to trust in its place, right? And so forth. So that was the problem we had with the people of Noah's day. Would you say it's an exact problem that we have today? There is no difference, there is no change, and so forth. Okay, let's go on. Second Timothy 3, one through five. Now this is, we're gonna do this real quick because we've got a long way to go. I wanted you to just get a few things about what God said, or what Jesus said, or the Bible says, what it's going to be like in the last days. So before we go to that text, in your own mind, what stands out to you is going to be one of the major issues in the last day? Anyone? Love is a self. Love is a self. That's easy to do. That's very normal. That's very natural. Isn't it? Okay, what else? Who or what will we worship? What was that again? Who or what will we worship? Okay, through our worship. Okay, and so forth. There is such things. Did Jesus warn us that in the last days there would be a problem with worship? Did he not? He said it a little differently. He said, false Christ and false prophets. And he didn't say one or two. He said many, right, will come. He spent a lot of time on the second coming about how it would be orchestrated. Now, we think, well, who cares as long as he comes. Jesus says it does matter. And it does matter how he comes, because if we don't have the right understanding of how he comes, we could be deceived. So when people say, oh, that doesn't make any difference whether you believe in a second coming, a rapture, Jesus says, I beg to differ. There is a difference, and so forth. Because one leads to deceit, and the other one leads to truth. All right, let's take a look at these, real quick. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And the last one, and this is what's critical within the church, having a form of godliness, but no power. 
The Bible says that when you and I are converted, we receive a lot of gifts, and one of them is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Is that right? That is the power of God in us to live the life he wants us to live. Everybody agree with that? That's what Jesus lived by. Okay. But we have Christians, Seventh-day Adventists and others, and I've been there myself, that come to church every week, may go to prayer meeting, but they have no power to live the Christian life. You say, how in the world could that happen? How is it possible to be a Christian? Because you can't be a Christian without the power. Becoming part of the family as God is part of receiving God's power, isn't it? And we'll talk about how that takes place because it's shown in the story of Noah and so forth. So that's our fear that we need to be careful with, but we can have the assurance that power will be ours to have because it's a gift God provides. And so it's the very foundation of our faith. The gospel includes the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of repentance, the gift of assurance that you and I, if we were to die today, know that we'll be ready when Jesus comes again. If we trust the gospel the way God presented it. Okay? And then how can we prove that? That we accept it. Noah gives us a good example. All right, let's go on. This, uh, let's go to 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. The Spirit clearly says that in times, uh, later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose conscience have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry. They order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received of thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth, and so forth. Uh, as you look at verse 5, it says, because it is consecrated by the word of God. We know for a fact that as Protestants, the word of God is our only hope of truth. It, it is the answer for all things and all problems and all issues. All right? And so forth. So, let's go on. This comes also from the Great Controversy, page 593. And I just want to say these because he set us up for this situation with Noah. To the law and to the testimony, this is Isaiah 820, if they speak not according to the words because there's no light in them, the people of God are directed to the scriptures as a safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the divisive power of spirits of darkness. Do you get that? All right. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous work in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the truth that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by what? The holy scriptures are, are out. If anybody tells you differently, they are cor incorrect. Time and time again, the holy word that you have in your homes is to be, to help you to get through these difficult times. Uh, it says, by their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. Now, my question to you is, and to myself, when you read something outside of Scripture, do you test every word with Scripture? I don't care who the author is. Every word. Every miracle. Because if we don't test it with Scripture, what's the ultimate result, you think? Deceit. Deceit. You ever heard of Jim Jones? He was a Pentecostal pastor in Indiana. He had charisma. He was a great speaker. And many of his followers who eventually moved to San Francisco and then later left the country because of pressure from law enforcement and others and went to Guyana, which our academy went there. And I asked my wife, because she, not my wife, but my daughter, because she went to help. Did you get to go over and see where Jim Jones and his people were? You remember the story of Jim Jones? The article in Newsweek, the front cover, showed all these people laying on the ground, eight or nine hundred, they took poison that he said they needed to do. And most of them, not all of them, did it willingly, but many did. These people were educators. These people were physicians. These people were lawyers. These were educated people. How is it possible they would ever get in that mess? I'll tell you why. Because they were not checking everything that Jim Jones said was scripture. They wouldn't have been there. Will you agree with that? 
So if we don't get anything else, that is critical. Now look at this last statement in the gay controversy. None. How many? None. Okay. But those who have forfeited the mind with the, who have fortified the minds with the truth of the Bible will stand to the last great conflict. Only those who have fortified their minds in the Holy Scriptures will survive the end of time. So when people say, well, how are you going to be prepared? Stick in your Bible. Stay there and study it, right? And so forth. God, Jesus said, you study the word because you think there is salvation, but I tell you that the scriptures testify of who? Me. Okay? And the only reason that the Pharisees, in essence, who knew the scriptures is because they refused its counsel. They refused to understand Isaiah 53. They had a pretty good knowledge that Jesus hit all the requirements of being the Messiah, but when you're not looking for Jesus when you study the Bible, the Bible becomes useless. Would you agree with that? Okay. All right, let's go on. Uh-oh. There we go. Okay. So we go to Genesis 6, 9. It says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man. We've heard that before, Job and others. He was blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. How would you explain what it means that Noah was, that Noah was righteous, that he was blameless, and that he was faithful? Anybody? How would you size him up? If you were to describe Noah based upon that, could you do a, maybe a sentence or two how you would describe Noah, not using those terms? He served God in his word. Okay, we just talked he about that. He and, and uh, tried to interpret things himself. Okay. He took him at his word. As now, God says it, I believe it. Okay. All right. Of course, everything was oil back then. They didn't have the scriptures. So everything was word of mouth. Of course, when you live 900 and some years old, you probably have a pretty good memory and so forth. So they got that. But he followed God's counsel, right? So that means he believed what God said is true. There's no reason for doubt, right? All right. Anybody else? Pardon? I didn't catch. What was that? He's obedient. Okay. Is obedience important in the Christian life? And the, why? Why is it so important? Because when we don't follow God, we have what we have today. Are we happy with that? Do we like to see people murdered at FedEx? Do we enjoy the fact that people are always picking on other people? Can't say a good word about anybody. All they can do is criticize. Everybody has bad points. We want to focus on their good. That's counsel to me. Uh, and so forth. God is basically saying, hey, this is the thing that really makes life worth living. That's what obedient is, shows that we love God. Okay, and we're going to come back to that. When we're obedient, it shows that we love God, okay? Let's go on, and I'll give some comments on this. Does anybody else want to talk about that? If you wanted to size up Noah, how would you say, based on what Scripture is saying? Okay, because this is important. All right, here we go. This is from David Atkinson from the book, The Message of Genesis. He says this. Now, he's talking about those points of being blameless, righteous, and walking faithful with God. He says this. Together, these points, they fill out a picture of a man who does what? All right. Now, what was the problem that we have told in Patriots and Prophets that the people were the way they were? Remember? Okay, they had no interest in knowing God. It says here that he knew God. When we know God, we'll be obedient when we really know him. And we could use examples of that for a lot of things and so forth. But let's go on. That's, from knowing about God. That's right. Knowing about God would be an academic, well, what can we say, an intellectual understanding of who God is, right? I had a pastor once, he was a camelback, and he, had, he gave sermons, you, you could hear the sermon eight times by eight different paths, but when you heard it from him, it's like new light. <laughs> you ever had a pastor like that? I mean, he got into the depth. He was in there, you know, digging under the, under the roots. 
uh, and so forth. But he told me one day, we were having uh, lunch together, and he said, you know, Chuck, my biggest fear is I sometimes get too intellectual in my sermons. He knew that he, that was an asset, but it also could be a liability for him. And, he meant, you know, and I said, well, how do you deal with that? He said, I learned not to trust myself. And I pray for it all the time. If I agree with most things, apparently something's wrong. <laughs> and so forth. So anyway, let's go on. Uh, he goes on to say that he not only is me known, he knew that God cared for him. What does that tell you? He knew that God, yes, Marjorie. Uh, they're close. You what? They, they were close. They had a relationship. All right. They had a, something happened, not just something, but things happened in his life. He showed that God was active in his life. You can't have a relationship unless there's activity. You know, isn't that true? I look back and I, this, my greatest fear is I forget how God has led me in the past. I think of my own weaknesses, and that's not really fun. But I will tell you, I know the things what God has done when I've asked and he's intervened. I need to ponder those things, right? Because when I know that God really does act in my own life, I'm getting to know him. I'm getting to learn to trust him. And that's what it means when we say living the law by faith, not by works. Okay? There is a difference. All right. So let's go on. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else we want to know? Uh, let's take this one. Now, this is from the NIV commentary. It says, saying that Noah was righteous and blameless does not mean that he never sinned. Oh, no, no, that can't be. Can you give any examples about after the flood that shows us that Noah was still having a problem with the bent to sin? Got drunk. Got drunk. You say, what? <laughs> not Noah. Of course not. You know, he, you know, it says in the Bible that Noah was a tiller of the soil, kind of like Cain. And so, so he, boy, maybe it doesn't pay to be a tiller of the soil. I mean, uh, these people don't work out too well sometimes. Anyway, he puts this vineyard, he built, you know, creates this vineyard, and he drinks the wine from the vineyard. Could be grapes, I guess, I don't know, and so forth. And he gets drunk, and he lays down in a, I don't know if it was a tent or what it was, and he's naked. And one of his sons, Ham, comes in and sees him, and he goes out and he tells his brothers. Now, the end result of that was that a curse was placed on Noah when he found out what had happened, not on Ham directly, but on his son, Canaan, but it wasn't really directly on his son. It was of the descendants of Canaan, and the nation of Canaan, which was, remember, driven out of the promised land when the Israelites uh, inhabited that land. And so, uh, because basically, that was a very sacred thing. And to, for Ham to go out and share it with his brothers, because what did his brothers do? They basically turned their backs, took a blanket, and they walked in backwards so they couldn't see him and covered him. And they received a blessing for that. So, we're all capable of sin. Bob talks about perfection and, and obedience. God is talking about an attitude in life. The general trend of your life Every major person we know in the Bible has had some sin. Many times it was in their maturity, like David, okay, or Moses, is that we can slip. We can fall, and that's why there's a place in the Scriptures that says, you know what, and I'm paraphrasing, it's better that you don't sin. But if you do, remember, you have an advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ the righteous. What that text is saying is, you're not righteous, but I am. And I'm the one standing for you in the judgment. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Why would we want to hesitate to share the gospel with others? That God will stand for me, he will stand for you, and he will stand for all who accept his gift. Isn't that true? And don't you think that will motivate us to want to live a life that he would love? A whole reasoning for obedience is different from those who keep law to be justified, right? That's the difference, and it's a big difference. Okay, it's the Cain and Abel difference, we'd say. All right, well, let's go on. Oh, let's go to the first covenant of the two. 
All right, here it goes. It says here, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. You and your sons, your wife and your son's wife with you. Okay, first of all, a covenant basically is orchestrated more like a will than it is a contract. Because God originates it, he puts it together, he tells who the beneficiaries are and the end result. And what our responsibilities are. That's a covenant. And so here he says, what is God going to do basically for Noah? What's his purpose of the ark? And so now let me rephrase that. What is the end result of all of this? What is the benefit of all of this? Pardon? There's salvation. There's salvation. They're not going to be destroyed by the flood. Okay? Now, this really gets to the gospel. Now that they know God has given the promise of the assurance that he'll follow through with his promise that the flood will not destroy you, he asked two things of Noah. One, build an ark. You think that ark was built good enough that it could stand the storm? I seriously doubt it. So why did he have him build an ark? How, do we, how does God know that we really trust him? All right. Faith is saying, I believe you so much that by your power, I'm going to build this ark. Because I know it's happening. Okay? So the reason and motive for doing this now is because you have an assurance that God will keep his end of it. You wanted to save the animals as well. Pardon? You wanted to save the animals as well. That's right. That's right. They didn't have a choice. Yep, that's exactly right. Well, there's one other thing God asked them to do. What was that? Walk in to the ark. Now, how hard is that? The gospel is probably the most simple thing in the entire scripture. Would you agree with that? There's not anyone that cannot understand the basic gospel. It's that simple. And God's asking us when we say, well, just believe in Christ. Belief means trust. It's all the things. Trust his promise that he gives you the Holy Spirit. Not because you feel like it. Not because you deserve it. But because God promised it. By what? By asking him for it. And he gives us all those gifts that come with it. That's the foundation of our faith. Everything else goes from that. Without that foundation, the Sabbath, the state of the dead, don't mean a thing. They're just a waste of time. Do you agree? But the assurance of salvation, God says that. When you're justified, in other words, he says to you, there's nothing you can do till I come to make you right for heaven. You need to be perfect. And the Bible's very clear about that. Basically, in order to be and inherit the kingdom of heaven, you have to have a perfect life from the day you was born to the day you die. And Jesus said, you can't do that. So I'll do it for you. And so, he gives us the assurance that even in the difficult times, don't stop in coming to Jesus. I don't care what you've done or how bad you feel or how you've hurt and how you've insulted your own faith. If any man comes unto me, I will not cast him out. That's what he's asking us to do. So, what would you equate the gospel with walking into the ark? Trust. Pardon? Trust. Trust. Because you've got to remember, how popular would it have been back in those days to build an ark and then walk in it and close the door, which God did. There had been no rain, we're told. Ground is watered from underneath, not from above. And then you're building an ark and say, well, what a joke. Wouldn't we say that? What do you say? This guy's really a nutcase. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we talk about a remnant here, and the Bible, well, our lesson talks about that, is if Noah had not survived and his family, there would have been no remnant. There'd been nobody to carry on the promise that was given to Adam. 
about that serpent, the serpent, the devil would be destroyed and a remnant would continue to live and so forth. So he had to do his part. Did he earn? Did he earn? And by doing those things, by walking into the ark and by building the ark, did he earn God's favor? No. He had that from the beginning. Yeah. He knew God. And he knew that God would keep his promise. He knew that God was not willing that any should perish. And his motivation was to step out. Now, you and I sometimes don't step out. Why is it, as a Christian, we've done some things, you know, that God's asked us to do, and by his power, we've been able to grow and mature. We're never satisfied. It's never good enough from the perspective if we go that way. But we're growing like God wants us to do. I'm not concerned about whether I'm saved. I'm now concerned that I can represent Jesus and do his will, right? Yeah. Noah also invested everything he owned to build that ark. Yep, that's right. What would motivate him to do that? I mean, really. Because he knew God. He loved God and he knew God loved him because he seen God working in his life. How old was Noah then? 17, 18, 600 years old, 600. You know, before Moses was asked to go to Egypt to deliver the slaves, how old was he? 24, 25, 30? He's older than I am, and some people say that's not possible. Right, right? yeah. The strange thing for, for me is that Noah and his family are the only ones on the ark, and they have a deadline. That's right, 120 years. It's yeah. going to be 120 years. So now we look and say, well, we don't know when Jesus is coming. Maybe if people had a date, they could get ready. Well, with his time, they had a date. It's a good point. No Didn't help, did it? <laughs> Didn't help. No. And so I think when we look at this, we can see Noah became the person he was because over 600 years, he was learning to trust God. And so forth. So when you fall and I fall at times, it shows that our trust in God is not complete. Okay? That doesn't mean you're not ready for Jesus. It means you still need to grow. So when we fall, God doesn't throw us out of the family. Can you imagine you have been converted? You're now part of the family. And even if it's willing, you, you do something. God says, that's it. You're out. Some people believe that. Right? But you look at the example of the disciples. You look at the examples of Paul. You look at the examples of Peter and others, and you find that during their time as they're growing, they make mistakes and knowingly know it sometimes. Right? Because they are still learning to trust God. And when we do step out and we experience His power and we get over that little hump, we grow. We grow because we see God walking with us. Sometimes the fear we have, God just needs us to understand, look, forget the fear. I'm with you. Let's take the step. I'll give you the power to desire to do that. I'll give you the power to help if you consent and step forward. And sometimes fear is too much, like Peter when he denied his Lord. Peter, many years after the cross and after the day of Pentecost, when he was trying to make a choice whether he should eat with the Jews or the Gentiles in Antioch, he made a choice. He lacked trust that God would not make it right between both the Jews and the Gentiles. Yet he'd already had an experience with Cornelius. So that's what sanctification is all about, you think? It's us growing and building relationship. When people say, well, I tell you, I don't go to church. There's a lot of hypocrites that say, well, that's where they ought to be. That's right. The church is a hospital. I wish we could kind of say it, the Christian hospital. For people who were sick, Jesus didn't come for those who were healthy. He came for the sick, which is you and I, right? All right, well, let's go on. Uh, God says that it's my covenant what does that tell us about the basic nature of the covenant? That was one of the questions in the lesson. It's my covenant. I think we kind of covered it a little bit. I know Eric, you're saying, hey, we covered that already. Right, okay. 
He doesn't he set the tones? We don't set the tones. On a normal contractual arrangement, it's usually a kind of a two-sided issue. You, at least you negotiate that. There's no negotiation here. Okay. He gives the promise. He tells what the benefit is, and so forth. Because he's concerned about us. His whole goal, and the everlasting covenant, as well as others, God is not willing that any should what? Perish. And he means that. All right, let's go on. It says, when God makes a covenant, he sets the terms and conditions of the sovereign ruler. It's taken from the message of De Genesis by David Atkinson. But his covenant people are invited to share in that partnership. Do you agree with that statement? To share in the partnership of the covenant. And so sharing would be what we just talked about. Walking into the ark. Building the ark. All those various things are sharing in the covenant, right? Okay, let's go on. And I think we just answered question four, which is good, so we can go to five. Uh, <coughs> this comes from the Sabbath school uh, comments up on Tuesday. I thought it's interesting. It says, by starting my covenant with Noah, God again displays his what? His grace. Okay, now this is very important because I think the author is completely right on this. You might disagree, but let's see. He shows that he is willing to take the initiative in order to save human beings from the result of their sins. In short, this covenant must not be seen as some sort of union of equals in which each part of the covenant is dependent on the other. We could say that God benefits from the covenant, but only in a radically different sense from the way humans do. He benefits and those whom he loves will be given eternal life. God says, that's a benefit to me, that you can be saved. Now, uh, this is pretty good, too. According to Genesis 6.18, this is from Bruce Watke's Genesis, a commentary, and he says this, God elects Noah for a covenant relationship before his 600th year, the year of the flood. The Lord obligates himself to preserve Noah throughout the imminent flood. Noah, on his part, must build an ark, and basically according to the Lord's direction. Okay, so that's partly what a covenant is. All right, let's go on. Uh, it says here, I don't know where I got this, but anyway, it says God's covenant with Noah was a renewal of his grace. Gospel-bearing covenant made previously with Adam and his descendants that the Noahic covenant was indeed a gospel-bearing covenant is evidence from the sanctifying effect it had on Noah. So he's saying what Noah did with the ark and walking into it was what we call sanctification. God saves us. He does that first. You've got to know you're in the family of God before you can do anything. We can't go out and witness. We can't go out and share with other people. We're not part of the family. We have to know we are in a saved position with God before we can be his children. Do you agree? We can't do anything unless we know. And this is why I think maybe I'm even in the church that I came before the Advent. We had testimony services. And we had testimony services primarily for us to self-evaluate ourselves about where we were. And you know, many of those testimonies were brief, as they should be. But most, when you listen to their testimony, time after time, a young man, a young lady, elderly individual, whatever, would say, you know what, I'm glad I'm here because if it wasn't for Jesus and what he has done for me, I wouldn't be here. And then he gave a very quick home. I'm thankful for the free gift of salvation, which I believe in the assurance of his promise. You know what that does to people when they hear that? Who's he bragging about? God. And others can have that too. Uh, and so forth. It's the, the real question is, are we or do we have the foundation that Noah had that we can build the ark of life and we know that we can walk to the throne of grace any time we choose without the need of a priest. Is that the story of Noah? How do we be prepared? Have you ever read these books? How can we be prepared for Jesus? Are there books all over the place on that? How, how do we get prepared? If we look at the book of Noah, it says, as the way you, as you first came to Jesus, so... Walk in him. 
That's preparation, Colossians 2, 6, right? And so forth. So that's what Noah did. He saw God. He studied God. He saw God in his life when he prayed about things. He saw God doing things. He experienced it. And the more he experienced it, the more he trusted it, right? If we're not challenged in life and then see God working us through our issues, how can we build trust in him, right? It's impossible. All right. Uh, very quickly, you know the last covenant God gave, because he gave Noah two, and you can see the text up there. The rainbow. What's different about this covenant? And in this covenant, he says very quickly, and I'll summarize, is that I will never again, including humans and animals, never again destroy the world by water. And I'll have this rainbow, because there was a climatic change after the flood, because it really started raining then, and they would have this rainbow. And he says, it'll help me to remember What's different about this covenant than just about any other covenant we read in the Bible? There's one thing that's different. Just one thing that's different. Don't second the... Don't second the... There's always a covenant between two. This covenant is only God. Ah! Uh, okay, did you hear that? This covenant's only God. You're not required to do anything. Right? This covenant is for the good, the bad, and anybody else you can think of. And so forth. Because of the fact, God says, I'm not going to, he regretted for doing it, but it needed to be done. But, let me ask you this, how many people were destroyed in that flood? Everybody. And that's un terribly unfortunate, and needed not to be. And, and yeah. Yeah, you know, coming back to that, you know, they say there were people at first who kind of, were attracted to this. But over time, they didn't let their faith grow. They didn't participate in the promise. So for you and I as church members, what are our responsibilities? What are we asked to do? First of all, know where you stand from a perspective of salvation. And if you don't have the understanding, not feeling, that you have doubt in your mind. We all get doubt. We all get doubt. God will tempt us even when we are assured of his salvation. He will tempt us. Make sure when you go to bed tonight that you know that God has the assurance of salvation for you personally. And it's so easy to do. If you desire it, you come to the throne of grace and you say, Lord, I know my life. I know I've been coming to church every day, every week, whatever, whatever it is. I don't have not studied my Bible. I don't pray a lot and so forth. But I want that assurance of salvation. I want to know that basically, Lord, that if something happens to me or my wife, or what, we'll be saved in the kingdom. And then you can ask him this. Help me to be a good representative for your cause. Cleanse me and forgive me and give me the power that you've promised through the Holy Spirit that I can live the life you want me to live every day. And Jesus will take you on his lap and put his arms around you and say, don't worry, because when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll walk with you. What a wonderful promise. That's the story of Noah. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we give thanks again for Jesus and his love for the promise we don't deserve, but which you have given. Today, as Christians, we want to do more than that. We want to be and live the life you want us to live. We know we've been told that many times we come to the throne of grace ashamed of our conduct because we want to represent you because what you have done for us. So we pray you'll give us all the strength and the power to do it. Let nothing interfere with that. And we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Thank you very much.